Welcome, my dear audience and friends, to Cancer Convos with Grace B. This is your host, Grace B, coming to you from New York City, the city that never sleeps and is home to Cancer Convos with Grace B. I'd like to thank you all for your amazing support on all our platforms. Um, for those of you watching for the very first time, Cancer Convos with Grace B seeks to demystify the cancer disease and bring on experts and stakeholders in the cancer space. Um, please ensure that you go for your medical checks until there's a cure. Prevention is the cure. So I'm sure you guys all know that um, the diagnosis of a child, um, you know, having cancer is a terrifying and devastating blow to the parents and caregivers as it creates an instant crisis within. Um, but what happens if that child is unable to voice its fears, its anxieties, it, and you know, let, let the whole world know about its frustrations? The parents would no doubt be at their wit's end as to what to do and where to go and how to alleviate the pains and sufferings of their child. So in this episode, my next amazing guest will be shedding light on what it is to be um, a parent of a child living with pediatric, or should we say childhood cancer, and what she had to undergo to be able to face this ordeal. Therefore, without much ado, I would welcome Rosaria Kozar to the show. Welcome, Rosaria, and so nice to see you today, and thank you for coming on. Well, thank you so much, Grace. I really appreciate you inviting me on your show. It's a pleasure, okay. my dear. It's a pleasure. And um, so I'm Rosaria Kozar, and I have a podcast of my own, and it's called Living with Scanxiety, the Cancer Podcast. I focus on caregivers of children um, that have childhood cancer to support, inform, and promote hope. I'm currently studying at Simmons University for a master's in social work because ultimately I want to work in that field. I was a teacher for special needs for 10 years, but I found after my son had passed from childhood cancer or more appropriately, um, avreola rhabdomyosarcoma stage four, that my calling was no longer teaching. So that's when I really turned into the field of helping others get through something as devastating as what I had to endure and ultimately what my son had to endure. Awesome. Thank you so much for that um, description. It, it fits and I'm really, really appreciative of, of um, sometimes our calling comes very late in life. And you, with what you have done, you have, you know, with your experience, have brought hope with your podcast, Scanxiety. And um, yes, I'm happy that you've been able, but we'll talk about that. I'm happy you've been able to, you know, pay it forward. Now, tell us exactly from your point of view. I know you're an expert by experience, like we all are now. What is childhood cancer exactly? It is hell. <laughs> it's torture. I cannot believe the number of faces uh, that I remember going through this and coming into contact with. The ones that I've made friends with, about half of their children, half of the people that I've met, uh, their children have tragically had their lives have ended just as mine, Brody, had as well. My son was diagnosed at 23 months and underwent over a year of treatment. We tried everything. We knew when he was first diagnosed that he was going to have to have a leg amputation. So he had what was called a knee disarticulation from the knee down. So his entire life would be that of a disabled um, uh, amputee. And we also knew that even worse, because he had radiation, one of the side effects for children, their growth plates get fried, essentially, and his bone would not grow properly in any, or his bones wouldn't grow properly in any of the areas that he 
was radiated. So he was radiated at the hip and also the knee, meaning that his leg would stay roughly the size of a three-year-old's for his remainder of his life. He also would not be able to reproduce, which I'm sure many adults know that that's a side effect as well. So going through this, the first thing that happened and the first feeling that we had was just, you want to do everything to protect your child and you want to do everything and it, you, you possible that you can with on, you would do anything and it's stripped away from you. You can't protect your child from this. They're going to have to go through hell in order to survive the chemo treatments, the radiation. If your child's doing other types of therapy, radiation therapy, which um, is a little bit different than target radiation. Mm -hmm. uh, so an immunotherapy as well. They're going to endure so much. And I've talked to so many other parents as well, and their children have experienced bullying as a result because of the hair loss or whatever else. So really yeah, child we'll, we'll, we'll get we'll get to that. We'll get okay. to that because I want to I, I want to encapsulate um, you know the, the peer pressure, you understand. You, what the, what the children go through? I, I I want I want to encapsulate that um, later on. Okay, um, I don't just want you to just gloss over it because a lot of kids are going through stuff right now. Absolutely. So um, we'll we'll go through that, darling. Permit me to. So, like you said, um, be, uh, what what type of cancer exactly was it, and what stage? And going back. Did you notice any signs or symptoms that he, you know, did any signs or symptoms pre present itself for you guys to um, know that there was something not quite right? Absolutely. Um, he had areolar rhabdomyosarcoma, and that is a soft tissue sarcoma, so it develops within the muscle. Typically, the muscle. Yeah, it's a, it develops in the muscle. So typically it develops um, in the eye or I, actually I think the eye or the nose, but I'll speak to it in the way that I know, and that is in uh, the leg. So in his calf muscle, he had one cell, it only takes one, that went haywire and uh, oh, wow. And it spread. So the way that we found out was his he his leg began enlarging, um, his muscle. Uh, it was huge uh, for a 23 month old. Like that side of his foot, when we would put it into a sock, it was very difficult to get that on. Uh, I'm talking about right around diagnosis time, and he it became so bulbous and, and hard. So we definitely knew there was something wrong. And um, in fact, there was. Okay, all right. Oh my goodness. So talking about your emotional health now, because obviously seeing such a thing like that um, occur, and it was, it was gradual, right? It's not as if, you know, Brody just woke up in the morning and he had that enlargement in his muscle. Was it gradual? Well, I mean, a period of time. It um, it took them from the time that we uh, notified our pediatrician. It took roughly, uh, I want to say, ten months to diagnose. Um, so we notified our pediatrician and we went through a whole back and forth and it took from um, October and there was all this back and forth and there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong. I think there's something wrong. I'm a mom. I know him first time, but I, I think there's something wrong. Can you look? And um, yeah. invited us in for a recheck and then just a whole slew of things. So from October until he turned 23 months um, in June, uh, he was diagnosed. Oh my goodness. So um, what, what thoughts crossed, my, cr crossed your mind at this time? Um, having 
gone through that for like about 10 months before diagnosis. What were your feelings? What were your thoughts during this time? Was it one of optimism, pessimism, or what? What, what did you go through? Because I can only imagine. Well, I went through uh, a lot. You know, doctors are excellent and uh, people, yeah. and they've worked so hard to get where they are. And they, in this case, overlooked something that was extremely serious. And mm -hmm. the sense of you're not, you feel like, okay, this is the doctor they should know. And uh, I'm the parent, but at the same time, you're like, I'm the parent. I know, I know. So uh, things that should have been done weren't done. It should have been um, scanned and it wasn't scanned. So I don't think me just saying I'm angry or me just saying I was upset or pissed off um, will amount to the amount of, um, uh, I, I don't even know how to describe it, but right in my, in my heart, there's a lot of um, disdain for what happened during so, that. So you feel that um, more could have been done at an earlier time? Absolutely. He was found at stage four. Absolutely. Stage four. It's a very fast growing mm -hmm. cancer. Um, that's my understanding. Uh, I'm not a professional or a doctor to, to say it is a fast growing cancer, but my understanding is it is it starts and then it just shoots off. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so okay. 10 months is huge. So um, he had to undergo um, radiation, as you said. Absolutely. And, um, was that the only way to treat it? Did he, or what was it exactly? What were the interventions that were told to you as parents that would, you know, kind of... Um, curve this aggressive um, cancer? Well, we went in knowing that he had a 30% chance of survival. And we knew, uh, they informed us immediately. It was a great team at Dana-Farber. Um, yeah. I can't say enough about the doctors there. They're amazing. They worked with us, explained things to us, took time with us. Um, we love them. And, yeah. and I mean, you, they they did as much as they could do so i don't harbor any resentment um mm -hmm. towards the the professionals there but uh we were told pretty much um if this in the first day if this before they took the biopsy if this is cancer he's going to need a whole cocktail of chemotherapy and mm -hmm. Uh, the side effects from that and that he would probably if the chemotherapy worked he would uh, get radiation and a very very high doses because of the type of uh, cancer it is and if the cancer reoccurs which it did uh, your percentage of survival goes down that much more because it's kind of like a virus that doesn't get cured from the penicillin so to speak and then comes back and it's that much stronger so mm -hmm. essentially that's the parallel i can draw so then we knew that he would have to have the amputation if he was responding to treatment which he did respond to treatment fairly well and he also responded well with the radiation it looked like everything was fine on the pet scans and the ct scans and he also uh in the all those scans basically i'll just summarize it yes, <laughs> indeed. so uh, and we what we had to um do the amputation because we were saving his life that's how we viewed it like he was cured. we are saving his life Absolutely. You know, um, as a breast cancer survivor myself, I mean, I'm an adult and I suffered. So I can imagine what, you know, a young child of 23 months was going through. And you just mentioned that there was a recurrence, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, wow. How, how soon after all the interventions was there recurrence? 
Um, well, typically with rhabdo, abdo, alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, if it is in fact uh, no evidence of disease, sometimes you get two years. So I was highly optimistic. He's going to survive. He's going to survive. He's going to survive. We have to get through that two years. Yeah. And it turned out to be two months. So it was very devastating. I'm very so devastated. Sorry, I'm so sorry. So, yeah, it, it came back. It was highly aggressive. And so we uh, said, we'll try immunotherapy. We did. And the tumor just kept growing. And it eventually, I mean, you could see it popping out of him. So it was, uh, it was devastating. And we knew that ultimately that it the treatments were essentially, um, they weren't working, so we had to take him off. And we weren't gonna do more surgeries or try more and more and more. Um, it just, nothing, there was nothing left to do. I'm so sorry about that, Rosaria. I'm so, so sorry. And um, you are so brave talking about this. Honestly, um, um, yeah, you're so brave. But um, I'm so happy that you're here to to talk about it, and um, also using your your experience to give hope to those that, or no, I wouldn't even say to those to one person that would be watching to get that hope and positivity and light, um, you know, from you. So going forward, how what support system did you have? How were you? able to cushion all these effects that were were going round, that were going on? D did you have parents or relatives um, to take care of you guys? I mean, because I'm talking about emotional well-being here. Were you with any communities that also had um, parents going through the same thing? How were you, ab were you able to, um, what should I say, be resilient? you know, during this time? Well, it certainly does take a village. I, I um, created my podcast because I didn't have uh, outlets that I knew about. And that's basically the whole reason behind it, because you mentioned me using that as a uh, way to help and uh, possibly provide community for other people. So we, in the hospital, we did have... Friends, actually, unfortunately and devastatingly enough, one of my friends uh, from a long time ago turned the corner with their child in a wheelchair, and I, I just started crying because, oh my gosh, my here's my friend from long ago that has their child. So we did have a, a friend, literally a friend in the hospital and their child was going through a different type of treatment and cancer. And uh, we also had a fantastic, my family was great. Um, I have to say my yeah. parents, we moved in with my parents for the help and they provided so much for myself and for Brody and my husband just, you know, if we needed a moment or two they were there and they were able to help because we lived with them yeah and it, it, it was hard we all worked as a team to get through it and I have brothers and sisters as well so that also was very helpful and we lived in a community um, at the time, Clinton, Massachusetts, and they provided a very positive atmosphere for him. And uh, they, I don't know how else to say it. So um, we did have a very good community in terms of that. And I just wish that I knew more about what is out there and I could have connected more with other people's stories so yes. thank god for that i hope that answers your question <laughs> oh yes thank god for that because a lot of people don't have they don't have family they don't have communities they don't have siblings you know they don't know where to go or what to do so 
um, something good has to come out of something bad, as you know, my parents would always say. Um, there's a reason for something to happen. And it's only you that can discern. You always seek um, spiritual discernment. What is this lesson trying to teach me? Where do I go from here? How can I be a voice for whatever experience I have faced? So, um, yeah, it does answer the question. And I'm so sorry. I'm so happy that you were able to have that cushion, you understand, mm -hmm. to be able to, to move forward. Yes, I'm so happy. So you, you speak, um, we know Brody has passed and may God rest his soul, but he has a sibling. Um, he and, does. Um, what's his name? And how did you explain to, to him about what happened to his brother and what was his, his reaction? Well, his name is Lucas, and Lucas, as a name, <laughs> I love that name, Lucas. Oh, thank you so much. And we decided when I was pregnant, pretty much, we said, "How are we going to do this?" Because we are going to have a few pictures up, and he, we had a Brody um, uh, cremated so we're gonna have his urn and we're not gonna hide these things from him yes. and he's eventually gonna ask questions so as things came up you know who's this person on the wall well mm -hmm. this is Brody he's your brother and I took out an album and showed him pictures and as he's getting older uh, he's three now but as he's getting older he's starting to understand more. We went to my sister's house and he um, had asked my sister, uh, oh. yeah, yeah, uh, was Brody ever here? And oh, so he's, he's, kids are a lot more aware and, than we think they are. So he knows he has a brother. I don't like to use the past tense, that he yeah, has a he brother. Has. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, he grasped what that means yet and we haven't told him we he knows that he's in heaven uh whether or not he grasped what heaven is i don't know uh we haven't told him that he passed from cancer those things will come in time they will and come. as yeah. he asks questions we'll, we'll definitely answer them mm -hmm. that's that's awesome and of course uh, kids you can't put anything past them huh? It's going to remain here for a very long time. And one morning, you're gonna, he's going to come to you guys and say, okay, maybe when he is five or six, mm -hmm. and he's going to surprise you guys. Okay, tell me the real story now. Absolutely. What happened? Yes, that's it, you know. So um, coming back to emotional well-being, I know we spoke about family and everything, but when you were going through this at the time, did you, did you, um, seek psychosocial support from or did the the hospital or your um should i say brody's medical team did they ask you if you needed anything or were you able to you know chill at this point in time um well like i said the doctors at dana farber or Jimmy Fund Clinic in Boston, they are amazing, and so are their social workers. However, we opted out of doing that, um, mm -hmm. and I just want to say we, but um, my husband and I have an understanding that grieving is uh, personal, individualized, yes, yes. so uh, we grieve in different ways, but yes. That's for him to talk about, not me. But in terms of having support, psychosocial support during that time, we did not seek it out. And that's one of my biggest regrets because I think knowing what I know now, I definitely wished that I had done that. I think it would have helped more. We were given a, or not given, assigned a social worker but we really didn't work with him. Amazing, amazing person. And I, I know people that have worked with him and, and, and love him, but I, um, we just chose to kind of shut down. We had the community, as I discussed, yeah. but 
And we felt like, oh, this must be enough. But now that I am in a place where I am, I suggest if anyone out there is listening to this and going through it, definitely utilize it. And it might take a couple of days, but things will unravel and you will definitely benefit from it. Yes, you're absolutely right. And um, this is something that you too, using your platform, can, you know, engage with people and we can, you know, seek out um, those that do need psychosocial support. Because you see, seeking psych, why I ask this question is that a lot of people that I have come across actually feel stigmatized talking about it, mm -hmm. you know, that they sought, so they don't say. And this is something that is necessary. This these are experiences that we have to confront and mm -hmm. we're not um, Superman or superwoman. Our emotions are out there. So mm -hmm. there is no way, even if you're not seeking psycho professional psychosocial support, you will mm -hmm. have someone that you could unburden your anxieties, your fears, your, um, you know, frustrations, everything. And by doing that, you know, that, like I said, it's always therapeutic, you know. So um, sometimes talking about emotional well-being is a stigma. I noticed, I don't know why, because a lot of people that I have spoken to using my platform, they say, oh, we did speak, but we didn't at the time talk about it. We had to do it under the radar, but now... Um, we think it's very important to talk about it and let others know that it's okay not to be okay. We, we mm -hmm. are humans and the things that nobody understands what we have been through that we, we, we need to, you know, put it out there for people to help us because there's life after every, should I say, experience. And how do we move forward from here? So that's the whole essence of um, psychosocial support. So I think with our platforms, we can actually push this, you know, to together. So as we all know, um, people like us that have been through this, it's, it's horrendous trying to navigate, you know, you have spoken commendably about um, the institution that took care of you and your son and all that. For those who are going through something now, what advice would you give them as regards trying to navigate, navigate the health um, system? Because it's quite frightening. I'm still trying to understand um, because, you know, for us, we must still have annual scans, still have, you know, interventions and all that just to be on top of our game and nothing is, is caught unawares, if you know what I mean. So what advice would you give um, anyone as to how to navigate the frightening world of, of the health system? What would you advise? I would definitely advise the psychosocial aspect, but beyond that, and, I, and I'm really happy that celebrities bring that to the forefront and, and attempting to use their platforms to um, die down the st uh, stigma, as you had mentioned. But I, I feel as though being your own advocate and not your own, your child's advocate to, uh, you know, essentially stick your feet in the ground uh, until you get answers. If you have a question is really important. I also feel like you should take things moment by moment and make singular memories. Uh, I feel as if um, I'm very thankful that I did that because if I didn't, then it, the time would have just been a blur and that's a whole year out of his short life. And we do have memories and I've memorialized those through or encapsulated them through uh, uh, photo books and whatnot. So when I do have a bad day, so to speak, and I want to see him and remember those things that I can go back to those books and remember who he was, what we did together, all of those things. I also recommend for 
uh, people to do and utilize self-care. And we can talk about self-care all day long, but uh, self-care, just basically taking moments for you. Your child is definitely going to have moments where they sleep. And if you don't have a support system, utilize that for deep breathing or stretching or writing or um, for women doing their nails or something, you know, surfing the internet, uh, any type of thing that really kind of alleviates stress for you. If that's watching a TV show, fine, put your feet up. Some people do the dishes. So <laughs> uh, it can vary from person to person greatly. And also mindfulness. And I, when I first was talk, told about mindfulness, I said, what is mindfulness? Yeah. It's really just being mindful of the situation that you're in and not accepting it, but understanding it. So being mindful, oh, okay, well, I'm doing this at this moment because of this. So you're aware of things that are going on. And I think that being mindful really helps you establish a positive environment for your child. So uh, for example, I, I was very mindful of the activities that were available that we could do instead of sitting around doing nothing all the time, I was mindful, okay, what are we doing in this time? And how can I make this more bearable for him? And I would give him options and whatnot. Works differently for everybody. So I think definitely mindfulness and the psychosocial and, um, and uh, self-care. Yes, absolutely. And absolutely. So, <laughs> and mindfulness, self-care, and you know, psychosocial support. Yeah, those, those are the three main things that and they are, of course, extremely relevant, yeah. even if one is not um, a cancer survivor or the caregiver of a cancer patient. Those are three very important things that um, we have to add to our to do's, you know, yes. da <laughs> daily to do's, you know. Absolutely. To, yes. Um, thank you so much for that. So, um, like I, like you had mentioned about your podcast and everything, you're doing a fantastic job. Thank you. Now enlighten the viewer about now, what exactly is living with anxiety all about? Living with anxiety provides parents or caregivers of, um, that have a child with cancer, connect and um well basically i'll tell you my mission my mission is to Absolutely. support inform and promote hope and mm -hmm. every single episode i make sure that those one of those three all of those three two of those three are encapsulated within that episode so every single episode will have something that mm -hmm. pertains to those or one of those um, three things. And, and yeah, so that's, I, I really stick to my mission. Mm -hmm. And that's you were on the show and you discussed radiation and what radiation and radiation burns look like. And that's to inform parents. So yeah. that was very valid, even though you were not a pediatric cancer patient. It's still the same. I remember the burns on my son, mm -hmm. and it's really informative. Um, I don't tell my own story. I allow people to tell their stories. And Absolutely. there's also nonprofit agencies that come on, and it allows parents to know what's out there for support. Thank you so much. I was, I was um, very happy. I was able to play a part in your mission and vision. Um, and um, let parents know what um, radiation is all about and how to, to treat it. Thank you so much for having me once again on your show. Yeah. So what lessons have you learned? I'm, so, I'm sure so many lessons, but what lessons have you learned? I've learned that everybody comes out of childhood cancer, whether they're a grieving parent or a parent of survivor or they are a survivor differently. And 
or anybody that just witnesses childhood cancer, um, and I'm sure it goes for adult cancers as well, comes out differently. Some people don't want to talk about it at all. Some people want to tell their entire story. Um, some parents, you know, it's difficult to uh, do what I've done and and turn my um, my focus into the childhood cancer community. I mean, uh, they want to distance themselves as much as possible. Others jump in like me, and some of them, uh, you know, are 50-50. So I've learned um, a lot about how people respond to childhood cancer. And obviously, I've learned a lot about how uh, people that are grieving um, deal I, I don't want to use the word deal I, but that's the only one that comes to mind <laughs> deal with the loss of their child so it's right it's roller coaster. You does that answer your question i'm not i'm face. not sure <laughs> it, it does it does okay. not, not not deal face that's the that's that's the word you were looking for yes yes face you know you had told me this you said face Yes. So face the diagnosis. Yes. Yes. So before we go, what words of um, inspiration and hope would you like to leave that one person that is watching us now, that parent of a child with cancer? What would you like to say? Never give up and statistics don't matter. <laughs> they don't. Because I... Uh, was friends with someone who had a 1% chance of survival or less than one and he's running around and it's been over five years and he is happy as a lark and oh, I know bless. people that had an 80% chance of survival and they're in the grieving groups with me so percentages don't matter so never give up hope and always think and believe in your heart that there is going to be a positive outcome. Absolutely, thank you so much for that. Thank you so much, Rosario. It was fantastic having you um, open up to us and share your your story. I mean, it's 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 not easy. Um, I'm so sorry if I was um, bringing out a lot of stuff, but um, I'm happy that you felt comfortable. Uh, speaking with uh, about it you know my guests must always be comfortable um, to speak about their experiences so I'll just sign off now and come back to you so my dear audience and friends there you have it you have listened to the amazing Rosario Cosa about her experiences as a parent with um, uh, and caregiver of a child living with cancer um, you'll be hearing more about her as her links will be, you know, on my um, posts on Instagram, on Facebook, and also on YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe to our show for updates. You wouldn't want to miss out on vital information. Thank you so much and wishing you love and light. Be blessed. Thank you so much, Rosario. And oh, nice to have you. Thank you. See you once again. God bless. I know. Bye.